Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Tuesday topic. Today's topic is uh, our preprints, the right publishing method for my research uh, with our guest presenter, uh, Dr. Michelle Kutzler. And so without further ado, uh, let me just introduce to you today's presenter, uh, uh, Dr. Kutzler. Uh, Dr. Michelle A. Kutzler, PhD, serves as the Associate Dean for Faculty and is a tenured professor of medicine in microbiology and immunology at Drexel University's College of Medicine. After a PhD in microbiology and immunology at Katz Lewis or at Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University and a postdoctoral research fellowship in gene therapy and vaccines at Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, Michelle joined Drexel University's College of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and HIV Medicine in 2007. Dr. Kutzler is the Interim Director of the Clinical Research Unit and member of the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine, as well as the Research Center of Excellence for Immunology and Vaccine Science at Drexel. She leads a research laboratory that develops vaccines against pathogens, including influenza, human immunodeficiency virus, hepatitis C virus, and the bacterium cholesterides difficile. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And more recently, uh, SARS COVID uh, V2 or COVID 2. Uh, her expertise is in the use of nucleic acid and vaccine performs uh, immunoadjunctive uh, systems to boost durability and quality of immune responses in the elderly and has been funded by the WW Smith Charitable Trust, NIH Department of Defense, and the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. Dr. Kutzler. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really pleased to be with you today to talk about a topic that's become you know, of great interest to many of us that are in uh, science and health and science who are, are working to disseminate our work. And so again, thank you for the kind invitation. And so today what I'd like to do is to introduce you to the idea of using preprints as a publishing choice, um, in addition to really as a, uh, in, in conjunction with really publishing your work through dissemination. And we're going to talk today about what do I mean by preprints? What are preprints? You know, how do they fit into the publishing landscape? And then we're going to turn our attention to the peer review process and journal selection. Um, and if we have time at the end, I do have some resources on writing cover letters and rebuttal letters for submission of papers. So let's start with preprints. So what are preprints and how do they benefit? benefit authors. And so a preprint is a full draft of a research paper that is shared publicly before it has been peer reviewed. And most preprints are given a digital object identifier or DOI so that they can be cited in other research papers. And so there are a lot of benefits to being able to post re full research papers prior to full publication. And one of these is that benefits to the authors include rapid credit, being able to get immediate feedback from our peers, and also creating visibility about, around your work. And so historically, most researchers don't share their work until after it's been published in a journal. Um, due to lengthy publication times, this can result in delays of months, sometimes years. But what if we could post our manuscript online while it's being peer reviewed so that your peers and colleagues can see what you're working on? So that, that's the idea behind preprints. And so more and more researchers are using them for exactly this purpose. And today we're going to talk about the pros and the cons of using preprint servers. Um, and so there's a lot, it's very complex, and there's a lot of things that you should consider before using preprint platforms. There is a directory of preprint servers at ASAP Bio. So um, this link will take you to a website that has a directory of many of these preprint servers. And so when you think about how preprints fit into the stages of printing, again, preprints are complete drafts of scientific documents. And so if we look at this figure as the stages of printing, preprints must be complete um, before becoming a published journal. So it includes, you know, this posting includes submission to a preprint server prior to submission to a journal 
before peer review, before it undergoes the editorial phase at a journal, before it's accepted by journals, um, copy editing, typesetting, and fully published. So when we talk about preprint servers, it's the opportunity to post your research to a server prior to peer review. The advantage is that you know, preprints are often made public at no cost, and so they're shared publicly, not only to distribute information to our research community, but also it gives an opportunity to invite feedback. And so preprints can be shared before, and depending on the journal, sometimes they can be shared while they're being submitted and under review at a journal. But it's important to make sure that you understand those journal submission requirements and whether they allow for use of preprint servers. And so, again, an important point to note is that preprints have not been peer reviewed. So, and as we all know, for those of us who disseminate our work, publishing and peer review is a very important process for us to, through dissemination. And peer review is a required step for original research to go through before being published in a scholarly journal. And so a formal peer review process typically involves scientific and editorial review from other research that have re researchers who have relevant expertise. And so after that editorial and research review by peer review, they can recommend the manuscript for publication. They can recommend to the editor that the manuscript be rejected. And they also have the opportunity to offer suggestions for improvement for a second review. And so this is what we mean by this peer review process. And manuscript authors, authors often take these comments and rework them into their paper to address the specific issues that were identified. So peer review is such an important part of the scholarly process of, of publication because it's intended to ensure high quality and careful considerations for rigorous research. So the reason why I'm, I'm going through this process is it really brings um, the point to um, the audience today that if you're posting to a preprint server, this article has not undergone that peer review process. And so when you, now that preprints are now being posted on public websites and including PubMed, um, it's important to note that there is a opportunity for um, preprints to be noted. So if you're pulling up a paper that looks interesting, is relevant to your research, if you see that it's a preprint, you have to remember that as you're reading this article to keep in mind that the preprint has not been pre-reviewed. It has not been peer reviewed. So all of the content has not gone through a rigorous analysis. And so there should be a large banner uh, that's made clear when you come across a paper that's actually just been a part of a preprint server. Okay, it's also important to note that a lot of our disciplines, so I work in the health and sciences, many of you on the call are from our College of Nursing and Health Professions, so there are preprint servers which are discipline specific. And so if you look at some of the data around this booming area of, of servers, since September of 2020, there were at least 61 public preprint servers covering many disciplines, and one third of them have been launched since 2018. So there's this increasing number of preprint servers over the past three years. Preprint servers are managed and supported by a range of financial models. So again, posting your preprint is free. So how are these servers um, funded and supported? So some of them are funded from professional societies, non-governmental organizations, foundations, and other types of funders. More recently, large publishers have also begun to develop preprint servers. And so some of these larger publishers may require a fee for preprint posting. However, the ones that I'm going to focus on today, relevant to, um, relevant to our health and science field, they are free preprint servers. So again, each discipline tends to have a unique preprint culture. And so um, it's important for you to, to discuss with your mentors the proper preprint server to utilize. And advances in preprint platforms are closely related to the preprint culture in specific disciplines. So for example, in physics and math and economics, those fields are known to have a strong preprint culture. But those of us that are in health sciences, you know, we are uh, relatively more new to this idea of preprints. 
And so let's start with talking about what are the advantages of using preprint servers. And as I'm going through these slides, I'm keeping my eye on the chat. So if there's any questions that you have, please put them in the chat and I can pause and answer those questions. So when we think about the positives to being able to utilize a preprint server, how do they benefit authors? The first thing that comes to mind is credit. So when you post a preprint with your research results, you're firmly claiming stake to the work that you've done. So this is important with respect to copyright and how authors keep their rights on their work. So with a lot of IP and um, intellectual property, as soon as um, data are published and disseminated publicly, the clock starts ticking for rights to, um, rights to that invention. And so it's important to consider as you're putting your work out on the preprint server in the public domain, there are implications of, you know, you're getting visibility, you're getting credit for your idea, and the timestamp begins. So if there are any subsequent discussions of who found a particular result first, you can point to the preprint as being a public, inclusive record of your data. And most preprints are assigned a digital object identifier, which allows your work to become a permanent record of the scholarly record. So one that can be referenced in any dispute over who discovered something first. And so for these reasons, there are several foundations and governmental agencies and federal, including the US National Institute of Health and Wellcome Trust, among other funders who allow researchers to cite their preprints in grant applications. And so that was also a really uh, positive thing as a, as a principal investigator writing grants. If I have work that I don't have room to fit in my grant, but it's not yet published in the past couple of years, now I have an opportunity to post my work on preprint server and then use it, um, the PubMed reference, the DOI identifier. So it's actually referenced in the work of my grant. And again, for those of us who do research that's funded by specific agencies, there are specific policies that should be reviewed. So before you post anything to a preprint, you have to make sure that it's approved by your funding agency. And so there's a, a, a lot of, of availability of funder policies on the website that's shown there. A second uh, positive outcome for preprint servers is that how does it benefit the offers? Feedback. You know, all of us seek to get feedback on our research in a public domain. Um, and so it's it's feedback that's not considered true peer review, but you know, it does give an opportunity for you to receive feedback on this public domain. The way that the preprint servers are set up, it allows for public comment. So remember, in the traditional system, a submitted manuscript receives feedback from two to three reviewers before publication. With a preprint, other researchers can discover your work sooner. They could potentially point out critical flaws or errors. They can suggest new studies or data to strengthen your argument, or even recommend a collaboration that could lead to publication in a more prestigious journal. So the feedback can be provided publicly through commenting or privately through an email. So this is a true benefit of utilizing preprint servers. A third positive aspect of the preprint system and how it benefits authors is visibility and citation. So preprints are not the final form of the research paper for most authors, um, but preprints and infrastructure providers like to cross-reference link to the finest final published article wherever possible, meaning that your preprint can serve to bring new readers to your published paper. And so interesting, uh, a study in the Journal of the American Medical Association saw notable increases in citations and all metric scores when authors had posted their work first as a preprint. So, you know, the citation effect that they found was quite small and more studies will need to be done to confirm that finding. But even the evidence that they've gathered so far that there's nearly a threefold increase in all metric attention scores. So the more places you can be discovered by your peers in the public, the more attention your research is likely to get. And the other positive is reading preprints are free. And so, as I mentioned, you know, uh, example of a preprint server for biology is BioArchive. And as it's, it's, this is um, a preprint server that is supported by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And this is an example of a preprint that was posted in the server. And you can see at the bottom here that the article was assigned a DOI, um, a document identifier. And um, so this is what's linking it to the full paper. And so the DOI, you would think of it as a home address. So there's a different address 
for the preprint as the published article. So if the preprint eventually becomes a published article, the preprint record may also include the future published DOI. So it links to your scholarly work. Okay, so what are the downsides to preprint servers? So one of the downsides or caveats is that the repositories do not have policies about plagiarism, competing interests, misconduct, and other harm hallmarks of reputable scholarly publishing that usually are rigorous and transparent. So that's a really important point. So as you're reading preprints, um, you have to remember that they did not go through peer review, um, that you know, there's no um, reputable check on the scholarly publishing um, uh, ethics around posting these papers. So just remember, you know, for some fields, especially in clinical research, where a lot of our physicians are basing, you know, their work and treatment of patients on evidence-based medicine, you know, thinking about if they're basing their work uh, or their um, decision-making on papers that are preprint, you know, just remember research uploaded in a repository may be misinterpreted. Um, and sometimes media, you know, who's looking, media or looking outlets are looking for the next big story, and they may be basing stories on preprints, which haven't had rigorous peer review. So the research may not have been conducted as rigorous and statistically sound. So things might be misinterpreted. So we have to keep all of this in mind. And then finally, you know, policies of preprint servers. What I've learned over the past six months is that some of the preprint servers have begun to include some level of screening before posting. You know, so they um, they may screen for plagiarism. So there may be a first view of plagiarism. Um, they may be looking for um, evidence of data sharing, image manipulation, you know, correcting those errors. So I think a lot of these servers are, are beginning to implement areas of screening before posting. And I have a plagiarism, plagiarism is definitely one of them. So they're beginning to move towards, you know, taking care of some of these um, ideas around misconduct and plagiarism. But ultimately, there really isn't any peer review. And that's the piece that, that's going to be missing from the preprint servers. Okay. So the first preprint server that I'd like to talk about is the BioArchive. And this is a preprint server for biology. It's a free online archive distributed service for unpublished preprints in the life sciences. So those of you in the College of Nursing Health Professions, this may be an option for you to consider for your preprint. Um, and again, there's lots of benefits to using BioArchive, your results, your findings. I think it takes about 48 hours for it to be publicly available and you can begin receiving feedback on the draft of your manuscript before they're submitted to journals. And so, you know, this is an open access preprint. It was uh, jointly established in 2013, and now it's currently run by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And, and there are some initial checks. That's why it takes that 48 hours. Um, and so another thing that has been evolving from preprint servers is now that BioArchive has begun to link to certain journals so that you can submit your research directly from the preprint server to, and I, I just checked, it's 169 journals now. So you don't have to re-upload. For those of you who have uploaded um, papers for submission to journals, you know, there's a lot of work to upload figures and cover letters and Word documents and inputting all the authors and so now BioArchive has the ability to transfer to about 169 journals, so you don't have to redo the process of submission. Another very popular uh, archive preprint server for all those of us that work in health sciences is the MedArchive. And so this is a, a very big uh, preprint server for health sciences. It's, uh, again, managed by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and also uh, Yale and, and BMJ. And so I just happened on the right, you can see there's different subject areas. And before my presentation today, I clicked on the nursing category. And these were some of the preprints that popped up that were recently um, submitted on uh, topics related to nursing. Okay, so some data around the Med Archive. So it's, it's known as the preprint server platform for medicine. It's designed for health science, was established by the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Yale, and uh, BMJ, and was launched in 2019. So it's relatively new. 
And again, the Med Archive uh, is able to submit directly to journals. And I think they have a list of 30 that you're able to directly submit to from the preprint server. Um, and uh, when you're looking at the data on how many preprints are posted here, there's 200 preprints posted each month on Med Archive. And some examples of journals where they, you can submit directly to are the PLOS series and, again, BMJ journals. And, um, and I didn't note that there were any specific nursing journals um, at, on Med Archive that you can directly submit from, but the, it's updating constantly, and I'm sure that will change shortly. And, um, and you can also, again, the DOI, it, it signs a DOI, so it's very similar to the other preprint servers that I mentioned earlier. And what's interesting is you're also able to, to get data on the readership of your preprint server. So you're able to download, so Med Archive provides article metrics. So how many article, you know, usage of your article, if it was ever shared into Twitter, um, so there are um, also some altmetric scores that are given, um, so readership, downloads, um, and whether it's been shared to social media directly from the archive preprint server. So there is some data that they're beginning to pull available to authors. Okay, so how to use preprints in your research and will ultimately depend on a variety of factors. So should you choose to incorporate preprints into your workflow, these are the major things to consider that will really maximize your impact. So if you are downloading articles and using them in your research, you know, always be skeptical of the findings. So whether a preprint or a published article, always critically evaluate the methods, the analyses and findings in the research. And check the criteria. So be aware of any screening or quality checks taken by preprint servers. So as I mentioned, some servers have policies describing basic qualifications necessary for preprint exclusion. Um, find more evidence. So find complementary studies where available. So don't you know always rely on a single report or a single manuscript, single paper. So the more evidence you find to support your conclusions is important. And, um, and indicate use. So if you plan to use preprints in your you know, citations, you know, make sure that you are emphasizing the uncertainty of evidence to inform the readers that this was a preprint um, and uh, not really have gone through peer review. Okay, so with that, um, I'm just going to pause and turn my attention now to the next phase. So when you're ready, to move from preprint server to submitting to a journal. And before I move into that, I'd just like to pause and see if there's any questions or any comments from those of you in the audience around the use of preprint servers, any questions that you may have. Yes, Rose. Thanks, Michelle, this is great. So I had a question. Um, if you were doing a, a lit search in PubMed or in Google Scholar, would you be able to find these preprints as you're searching or they're not yet um, put into those databases? Yeah, so preprint servers, uh, so papers that are in preprint servers can be found in PubMed. And um, what, is, what is important that I like that PubMed is doing is they are, if you do happen to pull up a paper that's a preprint, they should have this very um, obvious banner at the top of any papers um, that come up in your search. Um, so, I also am just, you know, I'll note that, oh, this is an article from BioArchive. And then in my mind, I'm already linking this to a preprint, but it should say it is a preprint in the, um, in the DOI citation. But as secondly, there should be a banner across to let you know that this is a preprint and it has not been peer reviewed above each of those papers. So great question. So much. Yes. Yes. Ben. Yes. Uh, I'll second Roseanne's. Uh... Great talk so far, or great information so far. I've done actually two preprints so far. And like, like you were saying, there's some disciplines where the culture is very heavy into the preprints. And then uh, many of us other disciplines are kind of following along. Um, and I will say, I have not gotten any feedback from that preprint process. It's just really just to get it out there. It's more of your second, I guess, bullet or first, whatever the three, it was like to get it out there a little, get the recognition before. Um, are you seeing some other disciplines actually starting to get more let that like you were saying bio is starting to get more into that that actually you're starting to get more and more feedback from 
those preprints um, and it just kind of needs that slow build that people are starting to actually look at it more? Are you seeing any disciplines that are slowly building to actually build more of that feedback into it? Because I think that's a great benefit of it, but I don't see it a whole lot. Yes, I agree. And I was looking at some of the statistics on that because I was wondering the same thing as I was putting this together. So only 1% of all submissions in, in uh, the example I was using was BioArchive. 1% of submissions get feedback. Yeah. And what's interesting is only 10% of submissions in BioArchive eventually go on to get published. And I just had to pause and really reflect on that data. You know, so that tells me mm-hmm. that preprint servers are really being used to get the idea out there and the visibility of the work. But I was really struck by, you know, 1% of papers are getting feedback, which is, you know, very minimal. So I think the experience that you have been is what others, you know, they're not, it's preprint servers are not being used for that peer review that we really thought would come from it. Mm -hmm. Um, So only 1% of individuals are getting that feedback. And I think a lot of us really would love to get more. Um, And then that second statistic really struck me is that only 10% of all total preprints go on to get fully published. And that really hits home this point that, um, that, you know, we have to take these, these pieces of work with a grain of salt, either, Either they're a totally different submission when they go to get published, you know, maybe that's why it's such a low percentage that go on to get published or, um, you know, so I think it's related to 10% of the papers that were submitted end up getting published versus, you know, there's a lot of rework through that peer review process. Maybe it becomes a whole different paper and submitted. So you're right. I think right now the current trend is it's just being used to get the idea out there and to use it as a way to bring visibility to your research and linking it to the eventual article. But mm-hmm. it's not being utilized right now for feedback, which is the which would be a great goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Great questions. Okay. All right. Let me just check the chat for any more questions. Yes, thank you, Rose. And that's another question is um, what, uh, faculty at the College of Medicine, as they're imp- putting on their CV, there is very specific uh, guidelines for if you're, we don't allow for preprints to be listed in the CV, um, that, you know, they have to all, everything that's listed has to be peer reviewed. Uh, so we are aligned with the College of Nursing and Health Professions as well. And I think that's a national trend. Um, so they can't count towards your promotion in full, full publication. So thank you for that. So I thought I would end um, in the next, you know, just spend the next maybe 20 minutes or less just transitioning now to, you know, concepts around selecting journals for submission. Because one of the hot topics at the College of Medicine, and I think would be shared here at the College of Nursing Health Professions, is this idea about predatory journals and online um, open access versus traditional print. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time, just um, lessons learned and the differences between online access and and traditional print. Um, and, And I'll spend some time on that. So you know, when you're ready to select a journal, the place that I always go to is about the journal to find the scope and the audience. So as I'm matching where I would like to submit my work, I want to make sure that the data and the findings and the gap that I'm working through is meeting the, the scope and the audience of the journal. And I always work with my co-authors and mentors to identify potential journals. I reach high. I I do research the journal impact factor, making sure that I'm aiming for the highest possible impact journal that I can. And then the, the, the question around should we use an open access format or consider traditional um traditional subscription-based journal, issue-based types of journals. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by um, checking to make sure that journal's indexed and also watching out for this idea of what I call predatory journals. So about the journal is a great place to start, you know, where I go look under the instruction for authors, you know, how many figures, how many tables, what's the length of text, making sure I'm fitting into the scope and audience, taking a look at what the impact factor, that all may be found under the about the journal. Another really important piece of data that I look at before submitting to a journal is journals should also be putting in their information the time to publication from submission. 
So they should have a timeline of how long, you know, data on their past submissions from submitting an article, how long does it take to get comments back from peer review and decision? So I also look for speed. So I don't want to send uh, papers to journals where their data is about six month, eight month turnaround. I'm more interested in, in really submitting my work where I know I'm going to get feedback in a very quick 10 day, two week turnaround, um, at least on decision whether it's going to be pushed to review. So all of that data should be in that about the journal. So I've come across, you know, ever since I published my first paper, I started getting email um, inquiries from, from journals. You know, we saw your paper was published. We're very interested in the topic area that you, that you work in. You know, we're inviting you to submit a manuscript. And I remember the first time I got that email, I was very excited about, you know, journals recognizing my work and inviting me to submit papers. And what I learned very quickly is that sometimes these journals who are asking um, who are asking for submitting my work, what I realize is that they may not be um, what I consider a established journal that has peer review process. So you have to be really careful about accepting these invitations. And so um, what I call predatory open access journals, you know, it's open access publishing has become very popular and booming business. And so it's, it's actually be, being used exploitative, open access academic publishing business model. So what they're doing is they're charging public publication fees to authors without providing editorial and publishing services associated with legitimate journals. And so I call these types of journals really predatory. You know, they're utilizing and taking data and publishing it, not providing proper editorial and publishing services. And even though you're getting your paper published in the public domain, um, without peer review, you know, you're not you're not really benefiting from from what you're paying for. And so there is a question in the chat I'd like to pause and answer. So Bonnie's question is, if a journal we are interested in does not have clear guidelines on preprints, do we contact them or assume they don't support? And so I had a situation just recently, we were, we were submitting to Frontiers in Immunology and we reached out to ask if we would be allowed. We, so we just emailed the editorial staff or editor and they got back to us right away that we were allowed to post on a preprint server. And I had another example of a journal where um, it wasn't clear on their website. So we asked the, the, um, the editor and they actually, in fact, stated that they prefer that we do not. It's, it's a, they had an... Um, a policy where they didn't want it to be in the public domain if it was being reviewed at their journal. So I find it more often that that journals support use of preprints. I think in the beginning in 2018, when they were relatively new, journals had policies of it, if you have your paper under review, you're not allowed on preprint servers. But now I think more journals are moving to approval. But it is okay and a good idea to reach out to the editor. And they're, they, they're used to getting these questions and they usually answer very quickly. So this idea of predatory journals, um, back uh, early in my career, uh, I would go to Dr. Beal's list from the University of Michigan, where there was a faculty member at University of Michigan who would keep a list of these predatory journals. So, and when I had received these um, invitations to submit articles, I would go to Dr. Beal's list and I would look to see if the journal was on there. And, and what he uh, was doing was creating a website where he had a list of questionable but scholarly open access publishers. Um, and these were the journals where there was no peer review. They were charging very large amounts of money um, and not really having the, the level of scholarship and rigor that we want. But then what happened in 2017 is he was sued by the predatory journals for having this list and he had to take it down. So he no longer could maintain this list of predatory journals due to the lawsuit that was um, that was in place. So since then, what was developed was the opposite approach, where now there is a directory of open access journals called the DOAJ. And this is a community curated online directory and it indexes and provides access to the opposite high quality open access peer reviewed journals. So in order to get your journal listed on this website, you had to have had to meet certain criteria. 
And so this is my go-to place now. And, and so as I'm thinking about my research and publication, you know, I always think about the four, you know, as I'm making decisions on whether I want to go to a traditional subscription issue-based journal or an open access, I think about, you know, visibility. You know, publishing my article in an open access journal means that more people are likely going to see it because more people will, will have access to it. So it's open access, which means it's a free, you can access these um, articles online. Cost. Cost is another factor. So if I'm publishing work that's outside of my grant, um, where I may not have um, a, a source of funding to pay for that publication, I may choose to go to the traditional subscription-based journals. And so what those costs are lower because in order to have access to that journal, you need a subscription. So Drexel University pays for subscriptions for us as faculty. So if you go through the Drexel libraries, we have access to many journals that are subscription-based because Drexel covers those costs. So for me, you know, if I have a research study that I may not have funding to publish, I may choose to go to the traditional subscription types journals because uh, the cost will be lower. There may be a small fee of submission, um, page costs, there may be costs for color charges, but it's, it might be hundreds of dollars versus open access, which are usually three to $5,000. And then the other is prestige. You know, this is changing, but back in early in my career, you know, the more well-established traditional journals had higher impact because they had been utilized for many years in publishing and they had metrics over many years. But now these open access journals have been around a little bit longer. So they're beginning to build impact factors that are similar to our traditional. So I might have to change this slide in a few years. Um, but remember speed. Uh, so if you are to publish an open access, the moment it's published, it's put out in the public domain versus a traditional subscription service. They're collecting articles to make up an issue. So they tend to take longer for your work to be published in the public domain. They have to bundle articles into issues. So sometimes you'll notice in the traditional journals, it may take longer to, to reach public dissemination. And so there's a lot of things that you consider as you're working through what type of journal you're going to submit to. And again, it's a conversation with your collaborators, your mentors on, on choosing the right um, platform to publish. I have also noticed that many of our traditional well-established journals now have an online open access version of that same journal. So sometimes when your article is accepted, the editors may ask, would you like to publish in our traditional system or would you like to publish in our open access? And so these are the things that I go through in my mind. You know, more people will be able to see it if I choose the open access version. The cost will be higher. It will be faster to get it out in the public domain. So these are decisions that you'll make um, as you're working through those decisions with your co-authors. Okay, just pausing to check the, the chat. So if you have any questions, please post. And then, um, again, these are just some final points that I'm going to end today with around just key concepts as you're submitting your papers. Remember to look at instructions to authors. You should always be thinking about preparing your conflict of interest statement. So this wouldn't, I'll go over, I think I have a slide with some things that you should include in your conflict of interest statement. Um, I do have some guidance around cover letters for submission with your journal articles and you, know, you should always be considering your author contribution model. So every author has to contribute to the paper, whether it's hypothesis driven, um, experimental design, data analysis, writing drafts. There are authorship contribution models and most journals ask you to indicate for every author, what was their contribution. And so that is very common now to include these authorship contribution models. Under instructions to authors, you know, there's also instructions on what length each of these sections should be, the order. Some papers put methods at the end. Some journals ask for methods right after the introduction. So getting the information on how to lay out the paper is always under instructions for authors. This is an example of things that we should be including in our conflict of interest statements. Um, so employment, consulting, stock and equity, fiduciary responsibilities, patent and license agreements, research support, how the work was funded. It's important to include the funding agencies that funded the work for transparency. I found that our Drexel University um, 
con, um, our compliance office was really helpful in helping me to write my COI statement for papers. You know, they walked me through all of my potential COI and how I should properly disclose that. So our office was really helpful in developing um, the statement for me. And then finally, uh, cover letters. So when you're submitting your paper, you know, you've already selected a journal where the research you're doing fits in with the audience scope. And so as you're writing your cover letter, you really want to focus on telling the editors why they should publish your manuscript in their journal. You should focus and be succinct about the importance and innovation and novelty of your findings. How does your research relate to the scope of your target journal? And so there's other things that you include in cover letters, information statements required by the journal. It may You may need to make a statement about how all authors are approving the manuscript, that it's not being reviewed elsewhere, um, and any other details that are required for that, for that cover letter. So these are just some example statements. You know, I'm writing to submit our manuscript entitled for consideration. You know, state the background of the problem and your question, your research answers. Really focus that paragraph on why your research is needed and clearly state where your research is driving the field, filling the gap of knowledge, the novel and innovative work that you're doing. Okay. These are some resources for writing cover letters. I find uh, the nature blogs to be very helpful around that. So again, I'm, I'm sure that if you come back and watch the recording or get a copy of the slides, fantastic resources are here for, for writing these cover letters. And then once your journal, uh, your article is submitted, you know, there's journal staff. They are going to be overseeing the receipt of your manuscript. So they are making sure that it fits all of the requirements around editorial and style and number of figures. The scientific editors are those that are going to be making the final decision on whether a specific manuscript will be accepted for publication. Members of the editorial board read and review papers. They also help to select reviewers that have expertise to help provide a strong peer review. And then reviewers are those that provide review of, those, of your manuscript. And so the provincial reviewers are contacted, they're given the authors and the abstract and a time frame for review. The reviewer either accepts or declines review of that paper based on the, the information that's given. Um, they perform the review, they submit the review to the editor, the editors examine those reviews. Sometimes they may need to ask additional reviewers if there's a little bit of discordance in whether the manuscript is rigorous enough for publication. Then the decision goes to the author with comments from the reviewers. Um, and re reviewers are, bl you're blind to who reviewed your paper. You'll never be told who reviewed the paper. Um, but the reviewer's job really is two aims. They, their job is to help the editor make a good decision on the acceptability of the paper, but their job also is to help authors communicate their work accurately and effectively. And when I'm reviewing papers, I'm always thinking of myself as an advocate for the authors. So sometimes reviewers get caught, get caught up in maybe some impolite or ill-considered language, but, but really the goal is you're reading that paper and, and ensuring rigor and thinking through all of, um, you know, how can I make this paper better? Um, is their work being communicated accurately and effectively? So my comments are focused on the constructive feedback that can be provided. I'm looking at methods, I'm looking at the results, I'm reading the discussion, making sure they're citing relevant work, how significant is the question being addressed and the overall readability of the paper? And then this is what we'll receive back from the reviewers, um, from the editor. So the authors will receive comments. Um, and, and then as I mentioned, reviewers are blinded. So the reviewer's identity is known to the editors and journal staff, but it's not known to the authors. And then the last thing I'll cover is the rebuttal letter. So hopefully your article will be accepted with no revisions, which I think is rare. Um, so there is an opportunity sometimes to be, have the paper be able to be resubmitted with revisions. And in that case, you want to include a rebuttal letter where you're line by line capturing every reviewer comment and describing how you modified the manuscript in response to that comment. And you always want to be polite, respectful. Thank you for this important comment. The paper is now improved because of, you know, because of that important um, insightful comment. So the rebuttal letter is very important. And again, it's a point by point reply. 
And there's some resources here on, um, on how to write rebuttal letters. It's also noted that you should highlight those changes in your manuscript. So you should have a clean version and a tracked version and a summary of all of the changes that you made in response to reviewer comments. And so we'd like to thank the referees and editors for evaluating our manuscript. We've tried to address all of the concerns in a proper way. We believe that our paper has improved considerably and we'd be happy to make further corrections if necessary. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. And here's a great resource for writing rebuttal letters. And with that, I uh, again, additional resources for um, when you're writing papers, and I'd be happy to share these slides and, and I'll stop there and I can take any additional questions that you may have. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, we have just, Michelle, just so you have a sense, we have some uh, faculty, we have some postdocs, we have some PhD students, and we have some research staff here on the call. So you've been speaking to a wide range of folks over the yeah. past hour or so. Yeah, great. I guess I'll kind of ask about, um, I know you said earlier that some, well, some journals that actually uh, kind of are published more in my field of discipline, so physical therapy. Um, I know the Journal of, I think, Bone and Joint Surgery actually does not allow preprints to be published anywhere. Um, so there are still some journals that are holding on to that, um, not allowing the preprints. I don't know how standard that is across many disciplines, but I would say to whoever was asking about checking about looking at preprints, um, with that, it's very important to go and ask those because I know um, uh, other colleagues have actually not been able to publish there because they put stuff onto preprints first and then they couldn't uh, submit. So, yeah, thank you so much for that, Ben. And I, I'm going to amplify uh, what you just stated. And I, so, I think with preprints, I think the critical questions and, and emails you need to send before that decision is made is checking, you know, the journals that you're planning to submit to, I think it sounds like it's about a 50%. You know, for me, in my experience was, 50, you know, half the journals allowed it, half of them didn't. So checking the potential journals, your funding agencies, I think it's important to understand your, from your funder's perspective, whether they support the use of preprint servers. And the third would be, I would email our tech transfer office, because as soon as you put things into the public domain, you have one year to submit a provisional patent on your idea. And so you're protected for that year for public dissemination. So, you know, those would be those three phone calls other than meeting with your mentor, your collaborators and making that decision together. I think Ben brings up a great point, you know, checking with the journal, checking with your funding agencies and, and also checking with, um, with the, you know, the patent office to make sure you have your idea protected. Uh, anyone else have any other questions or comments? Uh, I would like to just, uh, Yoka has been communicating with online. She's had been having some Zoom trouble and has been sort of in and out of your presentation throughout. <laughs> great. Yeah, it'd be great to hear from her. I'll see her, I think, on Thursday. So, yes, great. wonderful. There's a question from Bonnie in the chat. Hey, Bonnie. So do you have a time frame between submitting to a journal and putting and submitting the preprint as best practice? Well, I think based on Ben's experience, you know, I in my mind submitting it to a preprint server, I was I was hoping to get feedback. So I, I in my mind, I submit it for a couple of weeks and see what kind of feedback I get, and maybe use that feedback to improve my article before submitting it to a journal. Um, but I think what's happening and the trend seems to be that people are posting on the preprint server and submitting to a journal at the same time. Um, that way, you know, they're getting their idea out in the visibility, visible space while it's under review. Um, so I think it's really situation dependent. And um, and again, it's a good conversation to have with your co-authors about what's the purpose. What, what is the purpose for using that preprint server and thinking about um, the downstream, um, the downstream next step. So but, but great question. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for your hosting today. And it's, it's great to see everyone and enjoy the rest of your week. Great.
Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time on Tuesday Topics. Visit the site, register for anything that is of interest to you. We'd love to see you there.